Uh, hello, this is Victor Strandberg. We're here for another session in our studies of the poetry of T.S. Eliot. In this session, we're going to begin part three of The Wasteland, the section entitled The Fire Sermon. This is a long and complicated section, and so for that reason, I'm going to devote two sessions to part three. I'm beginning in this session with some background information about the title and its origin. I also plan to discuss the discovery in section three of who the narrator of this poem is. We finally give that narrator a name. And I think I'll begin with the narrator. We are told in the fire sermon around line 218 that the speaker is Tiresias, the Greek sage that shows up in the Odyssey in King Oedipus, Sophocles' most famous play and the most famous play in Greek drama, and in Ovid's Metamorphosis and elsewhere. We're told in part three, here in the fire sermon, that Tiresias, indeed he tells us in his own words, I who have sat by Thebes below the wall. Well, that would be the role of Tiresias in King Oedipus. And in that play, Tiresias plays the role of a prophet denouncing the moral corruption of the city of Thebes, where Oedipus is the king. Specifically, he denounces sexual corruption. That is, Oedipus has unknowingly married his own mother and has fathered children by his own mother. Well, that fits very nicely into this section of the wasteland, where Eliot is bringing on the theme of sexual turpitude as his primary instance of the ethical dissolution of the wasteland, the desiccation, the, the simply abandonment of any ethical standards in the relationships between people, and particularly in the way men treat women. I'm going to turn to the notes to the wasteland I should say, incidentally, one other thing. I who have sat by Thebes below the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead. Well, in those two lines, we get both the metaphysical theme and the ethical theme. That is, the causes of the wasteland being failures in both domains. We've already mentioned the sexual turpitude the lack of any ethical standards as a cause of the suffering in the wasteland. Tiresias did ounce that, as we have just said in King Oedipus. I walked among the lowest of the dead. That's from the Odyssey. When Odysseus goes to the underworld, he does summon up the spirit of Tiresias. And uh, thereby, we can bring on the theme of the burial of the dead and the issue of a myth of rebirth. Turning now to the notes uh, at the uh, end of the wasteland, uh, we have one other reference to Tiresias that is, I think, worth our attention. Tiresias, I think, is obviously a persona for T.S. Eliot himself. He is the speaker who's been intoning these philosophical, meditative, melancholy passages beginning with line one, April is the cruelest month, a voice that weaves in and out of the other voices, uh, making judgments and in general deploring the conditions, the spiritual uh, decrepitude of the wasteland. This is the note to line 218 in the notes. Tiresias, although a mere spectator, is yet the most important personage in the poem. 
uniting all the rest. The one-eyed merchant melts into the Phoenician sailor, and the latter is not wholly distinct from Ferdinand, Prince of Naples, in The Tempest. All the women are one woman, woman, and the two sexes meet in Tiresias. So that would indicate that Tiresias has a special expertise in this theme of the relationship between the sexes because he has lived both as a man and as a woman. What Tiresias sees, in fact, is the substance of the poem. Now, the time when Tiresias lived as both a man and a woman is explained in a lengthy passage that T.S. Eliot quotes here in the notes from Ovid's Metamorphosis. Uh, it is rendered in Latin, uh, and I've obtained a translation into English, which reads as follows. When Juno and Jupiter, the king and queens of the gods, had a joking quarrel as to who gets the most pleasure from sex, Juno claiming that men get the most pleasure, and Jupiter answering that we men do all the work, and you women have all the fun, they called on Tiresias to resolve their dispute because Tiresias was the only figure who had ever lived as both a man and a woman, and so he should know the answer. Tiresias, in responding to their questions, decides perhaps that he'd better side with the king of the gods, who has more power than the queen, and perhaps for that reason, or perhaps because he really believes it, he replies that Jupiter is correct. Men do all the work, and women get most of the fun. Juno, being displeased with this answer, curses Tiresias with blindness. Jupiter, who cannot undo the curse of another god, nonetheless offers the consolation that Tiresias will be able to see the future. And um, so Tiresias comes on then as a seer, a sage, a prophet uh, who can pass judgment on the wasteland and particularly on the moral turpitude that we see here in section three and elsewhere, especially involving the relation between the sexes. <clears throat> now, as we go to the contribution of the Buddha to this poem. The first thing I would do is hold up this page. Uh, you can't read it from there, but I have included this page, the original Buddha's fire sermon, the entire sermon, is included in that file that I placed uh, in company with the lectures on the web. And so if you wish, you could take out this uh, page and scan it as I proceed to scan it with you. This is T.S. Eliot's own original source for the fire sermon, as preached by the Buddha to his monks. It is a translation by Henry Clarick Warren, titled Buddhism in Translation. Eliot considered becoming a Buddhist at the time he was writing this poem. And indeed, he says about the fire sermon, if you look up what he says in his notes to the wasteland, you will see, say, see that he calls it comparable in importance to the Sermon on the Mount, the most magnificent of all Jesus' teachings. Well, that's quite a remarkable credit to the fire sermon, and it's worth us doing a scan of that original document before we get into Eliot's uh, use of the fire sermon in his poem. A few words about Buddhism. The Buddha was originally a Hindu living in India. Uh, we are told that he was a prince and that his father prevented him from seeing any of the world's evils any of its sufferings until he was well into his later youth. Uh, 
maybe his young adult years. Then when he went out, he saw a beggar. He saw other instances of the sufferings of the world and was horrified and decided to devote his life to amending the world's sufferings or at least devising a proper response to the world's sufferings on the part of the individual. He eventually concluded that the source of suffering in the world is any form of desire. And we remember this poem began with April is the cruelest month, mixing memory and desire. Particularly when we get into this part of the poem about sexual desire and its victims. Uh, these, uh, these thoughts of the Buddha become more relevant. In the Buddha's final formulation, how to cope with suffering, he thought that the way to find a, an acceptable life, a sense of peace in one's spirit, is to achieve a state of total desirelessness. That is the purpose of Buddhist worship, of Buddhist ethics, you might say. Uh, in our next section, Death by Water, I plan to go into the metaphysical dimensions of Buddhism, uh, which are less relevant here as we are still in the domain of ethics. How people treat each other, what standard should they follow? Now we're told in the fire sermon in this translation that the Blessed One was accompanied by a great congregation of priests, a thousand in number. And the Blessed One addressed the priests, all things, O priests, are on fire. And with what, O priests, are they on fire? We now run through the five senses, and each of them is on fire with a desire for something. So the first requirement in the Buddhist thought to achieve desirelessness, a release from the sufferings of the world, is to suppress the five senses. The eye, O priest, is on fire. Eye consciousness is on fire. Impressions received by the eye are on fire. And with what are they on fire? With the fire of passion the fire of hatred, infatuation, birth, old age, death, sorrow, lamentation, misery, grief, and despair. We move on to the ear is on fire. The sounds are on fire. The nose is on fire. The odors are on fire. The body is on fire. We shift then from total suppression of the body, of the five senses, of those sources of desire, and we now have to take on the mind. A little more difficult since thinking generally is at least partly involuntary. Nonetheless, the mind too has to be totally suppressed in order to achieve this perfectly blessed state of desirelessness. Um, the body is on fire, the mind is on fire, ideas are on fire. Mind consciousness is on fire. Impressions received by the mind are on fire. Whatever sensation, pleasant, unpleasant, or indifferent, originates in de dependence on impressions received by the mind, that is also on fire. And with what are these on fire? With a fire of passion, hatred, infatuation, birth, old age, death, sorrow, lamentation, misery, grief, and despair. So perceiving this, O priests, the Buddha goes on to say, the learned and noble disciple conceives an aversion for the I, an aversion for forms, an aversion for I consciousness, conceives an aversion for the nose, an aversion for odors, an aversion for the tongue, 
conceives an aversion for tastes, an aversion for the body. Also, he conceives an aversion for the intangible, an aversion for the mind. And in conceiving this aversion, he, the noble and learned disciple, becomes divested of passion, and in the absence of passion, he becomes free. And he knows at this point that rebirth is exhausted, and uh, that he is no more for this world. We can touch here just for a moment on the notion of rebirth in Buddhism. As a Hindu, the Buddha believed in reincarnation, which certainly is a myth of rebirth. But in Buddhist and Hindu thought, that is a terrible prospect to come back to this world of sin and suffering and pain and sorrow. And so the great objective of the Buddhist or Hindu is to escape the wheel of rebirth, which the greatest or at least the most celebrated work of Hindu sacred writ, the Bhagavad Gita, calls, I quote exactly, the terrible wheel of rebirth. Through desirelessness, through total suppression of both the mind and the body, the Blessed One, the follower of the Buddha, can escape rebirth, get off the wheel. We'll uh, then leave the Buddha's contribution here. The purpose of the fire sermon then in the original Buddhist version is to show how to get off the wheel of rebirth, how to achieve desirelessness and thereby to escape from the clutches of pain, suffering, sorrow, passion, desire. We'll uh, leave it there for now and come to the actual poem, part three, the, the fire sermon in our next session.